Well, hello, that's me again. Today is December 10, it's Saturday, and I want to start with congratulating uh, Morocco and its national team with an incredible achievement of breaking through the two toughest European teams, first dispatching Spain and now getting into semi-finals, overcoming a massively uh, capable and huge firepower containing Portugal. So, but let's start with uh, things which really matter now. Uh, and um, as I always say, there is nothing which happens accidentally uh, in this world, especially when we talk about the uh, geopolitics and we, especially when we talk about the uh, competition, let's call it that, competition of the major powers or superpowers in this world. And I want to present to you some facts, which I promised to do in my, uh, well, not my last video, but in the, the discussion board, <clears throat> in the discussion of, to my last video, where I stated that, yeah, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the insurance, oil cap, and things of this nature. And then, of course, we need to concentrate on something which is even more important than oil price cap and uh, uh, basically energy policies, global policies. But let's start with this. <clears throat> uh, it was um, April 15th. Well, the decision, of course, was made much earlier than that. And if you read the news, and I will uh, uh, translate it for you, and it is stated that the, the reorientation to the east is ordered to be accelerated. What are we talking here about? We are talking about here Russian government, obviously collective Putin, if you wish, decision which was made long ago, long before uh, even the special military operation started on the 24th of uh, February 2022. And here it is. The delivery of the energy resources in the western direction, they will be diminished. And that is why it is important to uh, um, in, reinforce the tendency or the trend of the last years, step by step, reorientation of our export to the fast growing markets of the south and east. That's what Vladimir Putin stated. Now, I believe it was on the 14th of April 2022 on the uh, 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 meeting of the, about the oil and gas complex. And uh, that means, and we're talking ag again about the uh, trend, which was already pronounced before that, that basically Russia is moving everything there. Uh, there is in terms of energy, especially gas and oil to the east. And I uh, just watch my videos, look up the uh, basically uh, uh, media, news media for the last year or so when you can see that basically China, India, other recipients of Russian energy, they don't care about oil price cap or any kind of sanctions. They buy it all, all like crazy, like there is no tomorrow. And here it is. For example, if you go and take a look at this, uh, and this was uh, four day, no, three days ago. There you go. China ignores price cap and buys Russian oil at deep discounts. And you have to understand that this deep discount still, it, if you look at the ESPO uh, 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 terminals in the Far East, uh, we're looking at the 68 per barrel, $68 per barrel. So, uh, not much of a price cap working there, and I think so, it's just the start of the volatility of the market, but then again, don't quote me on this. But look at this, Chinese independent refineries don't care much about the price cap, and their car cargos are on a delivered basis with insurance and shipping arranged by traders, Reuters sources st uh, state said. And this is where we come to the insurance issue. Here's the insurance issue. This is what people write all the time about this as if there's something, you know, uh, similar in the complexity of uh, space exploration or building their commercial aircraft. Analysts at Stan Chart have predicted that Russia's crude production is set to fall sharply in the coming year, noting that the key unknown is whether Russia can transport oil to its major consumers, including providing ad adequate insurance without using EU or other G7 services. 
this is the moment when you have to begin to laugh because we're talking about people who have no clue what that they're talking about including this guy who has uh, allegedly is the specialist in the tankers look at this according to stand chart russia has acquired a large enough shadow tanker fleet since its invasion in ukraine that it can use to move most of the displaced volumes however the analysts note that the insurance aspect is likely to cause significant issues this situation leads analysis uh, analysts to predict that Russia crude output is likely to fall by 1.44 million barrels. Let me elaborate immediately. People who push here their ideas, as it was the case with Russian sanctions, that, oh my God, we sanctioned Russia to death by removing audit companies, insurance companies, HR companies from Russia. Guys, let me give you uh, uh, some explanation. Solving complex uh, uh, differential equations, that's difficult. Designing and building commercial aircraft, that's difficult. Designing and building nuclear-powered submarine is difficult. Building GLONASS is difficult. Uh, providing insurance is not. It's all about money and some, uh, some my friends who are actually involved, my uh, uh, people who write on at my blog, who are involved with this, say, just a matter of few lawyers doing their job and here comes this other thing which is obviously beyond the comprehension of the graduates of all those ivy league and other you know top-notch economic uh, uh and what have you uh, uh faculties and departments in especially anglo-saxon world and especially from london people who still think that they providing service is somehow something outstanding uh no it's not difficult it is not difficult when you have a truckload of money. And here's the issue. Russia is awash in cash. And I mean, it is awash to such a degree that it, it, uh, it creates a desperation and absolutely helpless anger in the combined West. And so if London insurers think so that they can beat up Russian state, forget about Russian private companies, but what about Russian state which is gonna guarantee the insurance of the any kind of the maritime vessel which is uh, going to be delivering them they say that Russia already have like 120 uh, tankers huge tankers which she bought as the shadow fleet um, they better start learning real economy because that's not difficult they learn you can teach freaking monkey to go out and fill up the insurance forms and talk on the phone or in person then uh, designing basically how you have to insure something you cannot teach uh, designing of the commercial aircraft or space program simple as that and people who do that and especially have money they will have no problems insuring something unless of course and i people who want to read on that matter they and they think that it's possible because we know we're dealing with the people who are not mentally adequate in washington dc or in london paris or berlin if somebody will try to basically disrupt disrupt maritime traffic uh, i address this issue look up in my blog i will leave the uh, link below uh, this uh, video that basically russia has been building up including her uh, pacific fleet uh, like there is no tomorrow the stream of the new ships of the new submarines new weapon systems is just amazing it's i mean unprecedented historically guess why well including to fulfilling one of the major tasks operational and strategic task of Russian Navy as a whole, which is, of course, provision of the escorts, provision of the escorting of convoys, which is one of the major tasks of any serious Navy. And that is why when people say that, oh my God, there will be some insurance issues, no, there will be not. Some minor things, which will be, of course, blown out of proportion by the prostitute me, uh, uh, media in, in the West, and we'll have this. And again, just to understand what people are talking about, look at this. Just r literally two days ago, the Gazprom increased the delivery of the gas in China b b b based on Chinese request. And uh, actually, there were, and it was two days ago, it, it, they increased it by 16.1% over already negotiated volumes. And Gazprom just basically met their uh, request of the Chinese um, side to do that. Yes, the same goes with the oil. The same goes with the reorientation of the oil. And um, 
uh, when people basically uh, talk about this price cap and things uh, of this nature, I mean, yeah, I understand the uh, Western media need to present things, you know, they live in the alternative universe, they lie all the time, they, they uh, all the time, they need to sell some propaganda constantly to the already brainwashed Western public, but look at this, Vladimir Putin in Bishkek yesterday speaking about uh, uh, um, oil sale or, or oil price cap, he is his uh, his uh, quote direct quote. Russia is not going to sell oil to the countries which establish their oil price cap. That's Putin's quote in Bishkek yesterday. Cannot get any clearer than that. So and that is why when the uh, uh, Western media begin to lie about that, oh yeah, Russian exports uh, fall dramatically. Yes, they do. You know where? On in the Western direction. That's where it the oil is being sold for uh, below the price cap. But for now, actually, all major streams, everything through the pipe and eventually through the tankers and what have you, other means of delivery. Well, I don't know, spaceships maybe at some point of time in the future. I'm just joking, of course. They are all going to the east because neither India nor China, Vietnam, or anybody else there really care about price cap and Europe will have to live without Russian oil, period. And that is what uh, they try to basically hide behind all those, you know, news about the uh, oil price cap, which allegedly works. No, it doesn't. And in the end, there is this other thing, which uh, Putin uh, and Mr. Novak, the uh, deputy prime minister uh, responsible for the oil uh, sector, uh, state openly for, you know, practically non-stop, I mean, since, I don't know, probably months now, when they say this, if need be, we'll cut the production. OPEC already, OPEC plus, already uh, misses their, uh, basically, their target by today, I believe it was 350,000 uh, um, barrels per day. OPEC plus will cut the production too. Guess what's going to happen with the prices? You can bet your ass they're going to rise, you know, and no matter what uh, you do, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter because Europe is completely cut off Russian energy and Russia are Russians are not complaining anymore, especially after the fact that, be that Putin, be that Medvedev, be those big time Russian uh, people who really run the country, who control it, who after Merkel's uh, uh, announcement, they said, you know what, there you go. It just proved that it is, uh, everything was correct with us doing the, or starting the special military operation and that you basically cannot negotiate with these people. They lie. Well, Maria Zaharov went even further, and as did Mr. Volodin, the Speaker of Russian State Duma Lower House, when they stated that basically Merkel's admission is not just uh, a scandalous and pathetic, really. It is a direct uh, application for the uh, military tribunal for the war crimes. And that's what is happening, but yeah, you're not going to get this from the Western media, because obviously they continue to lie and... Uh, it's those lies, they cannot take this anymore. And going back to the uh, special military operation, you can see yourself this breaking point occurring right now because everybody understands, anybody who has any clue about, uh, you know, looking at the maps, counting numbers, counting resources, and this is not very difficult. Much more difficult is to analyze how they interact, but even overall picture, when you look at the uh, combat activities, let's say around Bakhmut, everybody knows Bakhmut is going to fall and uh, uh, Ukraine is withdrawing pretty much mold on uh, the units and formations from there because they sustain uh, uh, basically losses upward of 70% of the personnel. So yeah, it become they become basically this completely destroyed units. So, but the issue here is that uh, if you look at the trend, even in the ever line, ever misleading, ever propaganda driven uh, mainstream media in the United States or even in London. Well, in London, it's a separate uh, question because uh, uh, basically British media, which are primarily the horse pedophiles, all kind of the human trash which works there, they begin to actually uh, double down on this bullshit about that Ukraine is about to win and about enter the, uh, you know, the area of Moscow and 
you know, capture Kremlin, and they begin to say that, yeah, United States now told uh, Ukraine that they can attack Russian territory. I'm sorry, guys. They have been attacking it since the start. Ask people in Kursk and Belgorod uh, area. Ask people in the Rostov area. So it's just like, really? It's like, I don't know. It's predicting the rain when it's already have been pouring for two days, you know, and it's uh, the same thing here. But, but, in uh, a very important thing happens now when last week, no other than neocon and a very nasty anti-Russian, Russophobic actually, very much, uh, uh, media such as Newsweek, you have suddenly the, this opinion, not opinion pieces, kind of front page type thing, which is lessons from the U.S. Civil War show why Ukraine can't win. Well, they wouldn't have been American journals and American analysts, quote unquote, if they would have been trying to apply the American Civil War, which is a pipsqueak, a chicken feed compared to the uh, Russia's uh, war, uh, warfare experiences, be them from uh, the times of Peter the Great to Napoleon to Russia's civil war, which dwarfs uh, American civil war, but they need to somehow, you know, just to allay or address their butthurt by admitting that basically Ukraine is done. And they do this, of course, by means of uh, trying to apply rather unapplicable lessons from the American civil war, Sherman Lee, and all those things like, yeah, great, um, basically fire of Atlanta, which of course Atlanta at that time was a village of 10,000 people. A population of 10,000 people. But yes, here we are. They still need to apply this, you know, American lessons. There are no lessons which are applicable from the American Civil War because the issues of the destruction of the enemy uh, infrastructure uh, are old as who knows what, you know. And then, of course, just look at the 1812 a real war, not the thing which was happening north of the U.S. border in Canada. And then, uh, but I'm talking about the real Napoleon invasion of the uh, of Russia in 1812. And see yourself how Russians were destroying the infrastructure and basically uh, running away with their livestock and other things of this nature, which would create the uh, which otherwise would have been used as the supply for the for, um, Napoleon's army, which eventually found itself basically hungry, cold, and you know, having nothing to obtain from the villages which have been strung along the path of Napoleon. But sure, sure, let's apply the uh, uh, lessons of the U.S. Civil War to the uh, times of using the space-based assets, uh, long-distance, long-range standoff weapons, uh, uh, avi combat aviation, and things of this nature. Reasonable, but they need to always pack that those tiny iota of truth when admitting that it's done for Ukraine, you know, but they need to pack it into some kind of butthurt allaying or butthurt addressing, you know, painkiller, because otherwise, how are you going to tell to the uh, United States public and that basically, yeah, it's over, guys, it's over. It doesn't matter that uh, whatever is being shipped to um Ukraine, it's it, it just going to be annihilated, you know, because obviously they never know and never knew how to plan the real war. To uh, kind of show you how they, what is going on there, just take a look at this. Here is the Frankfurt Allgemeine on uh, uh, five days ago, talking about that United States says that, well, generally speaking, United States is not against the, uh, you know, Bundeswehr sending whatever they have, 60 of those, I believe, uh, operational Leopard 2, Leopard 2 uh, tanks to Ukraine and Russians just, you know, rubbing their hands and say, yeah, sure, why don't you send them? But of course, you know, uh, Germany states that, well, yeah, we may, but problem is that those tanks are not really designed to fight in the, the conditions. I'm not shitting you. I'm not kidding you. That's what they say, that uh, Leopard 2s are not designed to find, uh, fight in the condition which exists now, which is the winter and the kind of the mixed bag of the uh, terrain, it's like, then, you know what, the, the yet another uh, uh, basically Western uh, weapon system, which is really not designed for serious war. But this is what it is. I mean, and United States, yeah, they talk a lot about sending this and that, 
in 2024, 2025. Sure, sure. Why don't they plan for sending Ukraine something in 2030? Some super duper, you know, Wunderwaffe, which will be invented, which doesn't exist yet. But you can always promise, you know, as they always say, you know, yeah, especially Western world, especially Angela Merkel, you are the owner or the master of your word. You can give it, you can take it back. I mean, that, well, they, then they being surprised why they've been treated as the basically uh, non-agreement capable uh, party, but hey, it is what it is. And this is what is happening, and this is where they have to grudgingly admit what is going on, because they obviously cannot go out there and say, yeah, we fucked up. They will never say that. The modern uh, uh, Western elites, they don't have honor, they don't have integrity, and basically they're all corrupt, you know, academically, you know, knowledge-wise, uh, mo uh, morally, and so, yeah, you don't talk to those people. You just you know, deal with the issues and you go as you go in Ukraine until the West comes back to the uh, negotiating table. And that's when this uh, the whole, uh, so to speak, the, the department or field of the study in the already discredited humanities field in the West begins to appear again, and it's called Putinology. Of course, Putinology being the words uh, and how to interpret whatever Mr. Putin says, and you will have probably people, uh, you know, defending the PhD thesis, you know, uh, and getting those degrees in Putinology. So. Don't be surprised if it happens. Well, actually, it's happening already. But here is what really is the point of my talk today. And this is what many people do not understand in the sense that, yeah, all this hustle, all this chaos, all this, you know, show uh, <coughs> happening in the uh, public sphere, especially with uh, uh, Western media, uh, instigating the hysteria, instigating the emotional highs and lows, and thus basically brainwashing and exploiting poor people who really do not have background in military or in geopolitics, although it's two uh, things which are connected because you cannot have background in geopolitics without having background in the military. This is a separate issue which we will need to discuss at some point of time. But look what was extremely important in uh, Mr. Putin saying yesterday, and this is sensational, it's huge, I cannot emphasize enough. When Mr. Putin stated this yesterday in Bishkek, and let me translate it to you, and this is what was stated kind of semi-jokingly, but it was stated also as a message for people in Washington DC to consider. And he reminded, and when speaking to people in Bishkek, he said that, that hey, Russia can take, you know, this idea, or he said Narabotki, which is kind of the... Um, uh, b basically the baggage which United States developed on the disarming, also known as decapitating strike. Ah, so Russia says, you know what, if you continue like this, we will make their first use available for you guys. And here it is, he reminded, this is what uh, highlighted in uh, yellow, that of course the uh, uh, issue is about, in particular, cruise missiles, including on the ground basing, from which Moscow uh, basically uh, uh, refuses to use, of the, uh, to use them. And as Putin says, and this is a quote, we uh, refuse the use of them, cut them. And uh, Americans were much smarter than me, uh, than us at that time, uh, he continued. Uh, you know, they obviously cut their land-based missiles, and while the missiles of the air and uh, uh, naval basing, they left for themselves. But he stated, we have them now, and they are much more modern and much more efficient. And what is he talking about? No, he is not just talking about the fact that Russia may indeed go and accept, you know, basically the uh, concept of the decapitating strike on the United States and NATO. Uh, no, it's just not just about three M14 calibers or all those X101s which are extensively used uh, are used in Ukraine. No, the question about the hypersonic systems which are coming not online, so many of them are already in the serial production. And the issue comes to, you know what, such things as Zircon, which already has the prototypes of the land basing uh, uh, equipment, which means what? 
Well, people say it's bastion complexes which can use the uh, Zircon missile. I think so they can, because obviously if you can fit the Onyx missile into bastion, you can fit Zircon 3M22 into them. And we are talking about now Zircons. Some of them, uh, the ones which are in serial production, have the range of 1500 kilometers. The newer, much longer versions are coming. And then we uh, uh, are talking about, obviously, Kinshals. And then we are talking about Avantgarde's. Those uh, uh, guiding blocks, you know, gliding blocks, and um, um, then we talk about the uh, new RS-28 Sarmat, which is being now in serial production, with each Sarmat capable to carrying 10, 10 avant-garde gliding hypersonic blocks, each missile. So yeah, United States is nothing like that. And then comes this other thing, which uh, the kind of the uh, basically a random variable for the United States and for NATO. NATO doesn't have anything comparable to Russian air and anti-missile defense. Nothing, not even close. While Russia is in serial production from S-500 to a uh, 235 new to S-300 V4, all those complexes are capable to fight hypersonic missiles which do not exist and uh, in the uh, on the NATO uh, uh, side on the American side pretty much and this is what we have to consider and uh, that's the message I'm not going to elaborate more on this right now but you need to consider the fact what happens when Russia officially uh, uh, says that hey we accept this concept of the decapitating strike and we have the means both to attack and defend from possible response. What are you going to do? And that's the dilemma nobody, believe me, nobody in Washington wants to face. And even the, those mad, uh, batshit, crazy neocons, they understand only one thing. They, for all their, you know, uh, basically blather and all their pathos-ridden uh, statements, they want to live like anybody else. Some of them are completely batshit crazy, but yeah, they have to be uh, basically admitted to asylum, you know, um, committed to asylum. But other than that, nobody wants to die. Nobody. So, but when you have the situation, which it's already here, it's already here, it's implied already. And I am on record, and I'm writing the fourth book now. What special military operation and the use of the newest weapon system demonstrated that, I mean, there are people sitting there with their jobs, jaws to the floor. Because, and this is just the start. And this is what I wanted to talk to you about today. And uh, as always, guys, uh, those who like what I do, please support me on Patreon or buy me coffee or what have you. And I really appreciate the support of my wonderful uh, patrons. And just subscribe to my channel. And you know what? Have a nice uh, end of your weekend and enjoy uh, France and England's game. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.